Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer some patron emails, some random emails. Anonymous upper tier patron wrote in and asked, how long does dissociative identity disorder treatment take? I said that funny. (laughs) How long will dissociative identity disorder treatment take? I am feeling self-critical that I'm not healing fast enough in therapy. I have a long history of child abuse. I have struggled with PTSD, an eating disorder, severe depression, and anxiety since childhood. I've tried medications, but nothing helps. I'm now in my 30s with a young child and in therapy again for the last two years. It took a long time, but I feel very comfortable with my therapist and I trust her. But I also con- but I also feel like I am not making enough progress and that I'm still constantly on the verge of crisis. We started working on my PTSD and dissociation, and my therapist determined that my memory issues and dissociation was because I had dissociative identity disorder. It took me a while to accept, but I do now. I recognize the progress, and my therapist tells me trauma like mine and and dissociative identity disorder takes a long time to work through. But I feel like I'm not working hard enough, and I should be less miserable after two years, like I'm failing therapy. I guess my question is, how long do issues like this generally take? Um, Just chime in here. Yeah, well, first off, Anonymous Separateur Patron, I'm really glad that you are in therapy, that you've given it a chance, and that you're valuing yourself enough to um, counter all of the messages you've been given as a child that you don't matter and that you don't deserve to heal. And and so I'm, I'm so happy for you that you're in therapy with a therapist that you connect with that seems to understand you. But to answer your question, you know, how long do issues like this generally take? It's a lifetime. Uh, Given what you said, I I don't know you, but given what you said, I've worked with people. I I have friends who have uh, histories like yours. And in my experience, it, it never ends. The therapy never ends. The healing never ends. The pain never ends. And I know that that is not what people want to hear. And you're not going to hear researchers say that. You're not going to hear professors say that either because we live in a medical model as a profession. And not only as a medical, there are sections of the, even in the medical field that are uh, kind of bent on healing, on curing, right? Like when, you know, you have an 85 year old person who comes in with cancer, there will be this sometimes tendency and it's changing in the medical field to you know do everything you can to cure the cancer without considering the holistic situation which is that the patient is 85 years old has other medical issues is in the last years of their life regardless of their cancer diagnosis and what do we want to do here you know do we aggressively attack the cancer Or do we consider the bigger picture and say like, well, the person's going to die in all likelihood in the next five to 10 years anyway. So what's the quality of life um, kind of situation? Um, And, and so some people will switch, you know, to this more holistic. So my, my, I don't want to say that your diagnosis is like cancer. What I'm saying is that with therapy, you will experience or Oh, I can't say that. <laughs> With therapy, you you are possibly and maybe probably going to experience symptom reduction over time, as you already have. You, I didn't read your whole email, but you talked about how you've had symptom reduction. So that makes it worth it, 100%. Uh, uh, you know, symptom reduction, is, even if you're going from, you know, on a scale from 1 to 10, if you're going from 10 to 7, you know, that's a big deal. You're still a 7, which sucks. But the, there's this notion in our culture or even in our field that treatment is supposed to work and it's supposed to work relatively quickly, like within a year or two. And in my experience with people like yours, with the history, you know, history like yours and the symptoms like yours, it, it never goes away. And you, you know, you come from a 10 and say you work in therapy for 30 years, you get it down to a five. It's a lot better than a 10, but five is still a lot of symptoms and a lot of suffering, but it's better than a 10. And so we have to acknowledge that. Now you might get down to a one, who knows, but you know, maybe you're just at a plateau and the next phase of therapy will push you to the next level. Who knows, you know, maybe get a second opinion. I don't know. It, it's, um, it's, it takes a long time. 
The other thing that you're saying is that you feel like you're failing therapy. And of course, this is likely the abuser entering your mind and saying that there's something wrong with you. And so that is um, an absurd internalized voice that is absurd. So don't listen to it. You're in therapy, you're working hard, you're doing, you know, you're facing it, you're courageous, you're strong, you've survived, you're better than me, you know, I didn't go through what you went through, and, and, and you survived, and you're pushing forward, and you're raising your child, and, you know, you're, you're stronger, and more resilient, and, and better than I am, so, uh, you know, don't ever think that you're failing in therapy, or failing in life, that is an outside voice, that is still abusing you from the inside. You also ask, do therapists get irritated or disappointed when clients who are constantly struggling? Do, do therapists get irritated or disappointed when their clients are constantly struggling? Um, so the first, the short answer is no, but the, the more elaborate answer is, yeah, I, I'm kind of. Therapists are humans and they have hopes for you. And when you go from a 10 to an eight over the span of five years, it's disappointing to them because, because they care about you. You know, they're disappointed on your behalf. They, and they're frustrated with, they're usually frustrated with themselves. They're usually judging themselves saying, how come I've, I'm feeling this client, you know, they're, they're still struggling at an eight out of 10. What's wrong with me, you know? And that's where proper training and supervision comes in and mentorship that says, look, you've gone from a 10 to an eight. And, and a lot of my, work with my supervisees was along these lines, whether it was an individual or a couple or a family, I often would find myself saying, you're, you have an idea in your mind about how fast therapy should go. That is completely irrational. And based on, I don't know, like the movies or something, people come in with, you know, and I say this to my students as well, you know, people come to therapy because they have problems and these problems are They've tried, you know, the individuals and maybe even people outside of them and maybe even previous therapists have tried to fix this problem and nothing has worked. So by its nature, this the problems that usually clients bring to us are, you know, extremely tenacious and pervasive and huge and you know, immovable, Im immobile in, in some, you know, ways. Uh, you can't move it. And it takes a long time. So... Uh, we all have to, as clinicians and as clients, just recognize the reality. It doesn't mean you don't hope. It doesn't mean you don't try to accelerate healing, but it, it does mean that you are, are realistic about it. And anonymous upper tier patron, even those who don't have childhoods like yours are still suffering. You know, that, that's the other myth, particularly in the United States, is that normal people don't suffer the everyone is suffering so even if you didn't have the history that you did and even if you didn't have ptsd and all these other you know dissociative identity disorder association um you'd still be suffering <laughs> you know life sucks in a lot of ways the world sucks in a lot of ways people suck in a lot of ways and it's you know life sucks and there's no way around it. Now, it doesn't mean we aren't resilient. It doesn't mean we don't have joy or happiness or, or love or glory, but it does mean that life sucks at times <laughs> and sometimes often. So to feel like, man, life sucks, you know, you're in the majority, if not the universal. <laughs> so that, that's the other thing. Um, but again, I, I want I want to give everyone hope. I know a lot of you are, are in long term therapy. You know, take Bob for example. You've heard him on the podcast. He's been in therapy for thirty years, and he still struggles tremendously. But he's a lot better now than he was before, and he ekes out a lot more happiness and joy and contentment and closeness and attachment security because of the therapy that he's in than he would otherwise. So it's both. It takes a lifetime. You, it always is with you and the work is worth it. It's, it's both. All right, this next email is related to the last email. Patron Joe from Europe wrote in and said, I had, a, I had experienced severe childhood abuse, including emotional, physical, and sexual violence. I tried therapy a couple times with limited benefit. 
After starting to follow your content, I sought out a therapist again and saw her for about a year. I had opened up to her about the many incidents, including childhood sexual abuse, but I did not really feel like it helped me in any way. After a year, I stopped going. A month ago, I had an incident of sexual harassment at work, and I think it really triggered me and reminded me of my childhood experiences. For a month now, I have had issues sleeping, focusing, my mood is low, I have no motivation, I randomly start crying. My question is, what was therapy actually supposed to do? Uh, just chime me in here. Well, first off, patron Joe from Europe, I'm really sorry that one, you were uh, you know, severely abused throughout your childhood in a variety of ways, which is awful and criminal and immoral and unjust in a billion different ways. And then you get sexually harassed at work, which is also criminal and immoral and terrible. So I'm sorry you're going through that. Um, it's common enough. And it's one of the things that really bums me out about our planet is that as we are made more aware of the abuse that children go through, it doesn't seem to actually reduce it. I mean, I'd like to think that it's less, so you know, less prevalent, you know, a, a little less prevalent now, at, at least in my neck of the woods, you know, in terms of children being abused. But I don't know, you know, I, there's still a lot of people reporting abuse. You know, abuse is just so hidden, right? And children don't know what to do. And they, and even when they do report it, people off, often don't listen or they, they don't believe them. So it's, or the response is completely inefficient or inadequate, um, even from my field. And uh, it's just, it's, you know, it's depressing to think about because there's so many other things that we, you know, we always think, oh, we're, we're moving forward in society, right? We're passing laws that are provide social justice or look at the new iPhone. It's so much better than the old one. It always just feels like we're moving forward. And yet there's these markers, you know, climate change, another one that indicate things are either they're staying the same or they're getting worse. And, you know, this is one of those things. And anyway, so you ask patron Joe, uh, what was therapy actually supposed to do? Um, so it sounds like from your email, you're like, okay, I went to therapy a couple times, didn't really work. And then I, after listening to your podcast, I, you know, sought out another therapist and I saw her for, for about a year. I, I, I seemed, I liked her, but it didn't really seem to do anything. Well, I, I don't know what happened, but one, as with the previous emailer, a year of therapy might not be enough. Uh, in fact, I, I, I think it's likely it's not enough. Uh, two, it might not have been the right kind of therapist. It might have been a good therapist for what it was, like someone to talk to, which a lot of therapists kind of gravitate towards. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when someone comes into your office with a very particular problem, like PTSD, it sounds like you suffer from PTSD, complex PTSD. I don't know that. You'd have to be evaluated. Uh, you can't just support someone and cure their complex PTSD. You have to have a very detailed technical understanding of the brain and trauma and trauma treatment and, and tailor that to each individual client and react week to week. And that, that's the thing that I learned about trauma therapy is that you have to understand so much and apply it in this very individualized way to each client because each client has a different presentation and is at a different point regarding their ability to withstand the necessary ingredients of therapy to help them. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really complicated. No two PTSD clients I worked with were the same. And especially in the first, you know, six to 12 months with clients, every week was a complete reevaluation of the treatment plan based on my knowledge of them and the treatment and I and I had to lead the way you know I, I couldn't depend on the client to be able to lead the way because they didn't know what they were getting into I I knew what they were getting into so it's it's very technical and it's very different than other kinds of therapy you know CBT is not this way humanistic therapy is not this way psychodynamic therapy is not this way uh, attachment-based therapy isn't this way but you know trauma therapy is very particular and 
So, and a lot of client, a lot of therapists don't know how to do this. Um, and, and two, a lot of these therapists who don't know how to do this, they don't know they don't know how to do this. They think they know how to treat trauma. People will say that they specialize in trauma and in reality, they have no idea what to do with trauma. There's so many therapists that are like that. So patron Joe, it's, you know, I don't know, obviously you didn't go into detail about the therapy you went through, but I, I would seek someone that specializes in trauma and talks the way, at least similar to the way that I do in terms of understanding your triggers, understanding your distress level, understanding exposure. You know, you could go to an EMDR person, uh, you're, you could be pretty confident in that mode of therapy possibly helping. You could go to cognitive processing therapy. Um, I wouldn't recommend that one so much. It's a, it's a little too brief for me. And EMDR can actually be uh, done in a pretty manualized brief way. Um, but at the very least, it, finding someone that really specializes in trauma, not necessarily someone that says they specialize in trauma, you'd have to interview them. And it's really a sad state of affairs when I have to recommend, you're in Europe, so I, I don't know, you know what things are like in your neck of the woods. It, uh, I'm sure it's similar to what's happening in my neck of the woods, but it's a real sad state of affairs that I have to coach y'all on how to determine if your therapist is an idiot or not. <laughs> you know, like, because, you know, it's one, th it's like there are, uh, you know, medical doctors walking around saying they specialize in cancer and they have no idea how to treat cancer. And so you go to a cancer clinic and you as a patient have to actually figure out if this if this medical professional actually understands cancer or not because there's a chance that they don't even though they say that they are now some of you <laughs> patients out there have probably experienced that in the medical field you know but it's not as bad i, I don't think in the medical field uh in in my field there's just so many there are so many therapists who you know went to graduate school and believe they know how to treat trauma, you know, because it's such a obvious, of course, I'm a therapist. I know how to treat trauma. And I used to be that way when I first started. Anyway, so you ask another question. How was it supposed to help me after initially opening up? Well, you know, listen to all my episodes on trauma therapy. But generally speaking, um, just opening up and telling your therapist about the traumas you went through is not sufficient by far to actually heal the PTSD that you suffer from. And essentially, you know, the trauma treatment and EMDR, these kinds of things, these actually rewire your brain such that when you are triggered by a reminder of the trauma, you don't have a physiological reaction based on your neuronal reality. So it's a, it's not just like, oh, I opened up and I got something off my chest. No, you're actually, you actually have to rewire your brain such that you re, you know the memories that you have about the events of which there are maybe thousands are no longer associated with terror you might not enjoy those memories but you're not completely thrown into a physiological nightmare and hurricane as a result of the trigger um you say i don't feel like i'm at a better place than before therapy even though i had a decent relationship with my therapist yeah but I still think that I just don't understand how exactly therapy was supposed to help me or if I did something wrong that it did not help me. Um, no, I'm sure you had nothing. Yeah, I'm sure it's not on you. Uh, I, I'm going to take a guess and say that your therapist was nice, that your therapist was there for you, but that your therapist didn't really understand how to treat trauma and or didn't explain it to you well enough such that you you know, went to your therapist, it felt good, you had a good relationship. And you know, this could have been a good could have been a good use of your time. Um, overall, you know, in the 10 years that you need therapy for uh, healing, that first year might have been necessary, you know, just to kind of get into therapy to feel like someone understands you to feel comfortable. Uh, that that absolutely could have been a worthy first year of therapy. Now it's time to find someone that specializes in trauma. All right, this next email is from annual patron Michael from New York City. By the way, if you're a patron and you, and you can become an annual patron, that really helps us out. 
because monthly patrons, you know, things fluctuate month to month and it's hard to plan for the future. And when people become annual patrons and we can kind of know like, okay, this is, this is where we stand. And by the way, you also get a discount, I think 10%, if I'm not mistaken, annual patron, Michael from New York city says, what is your take on the claim that a growing number of people are suffering from depression and anxiety due to digital addictions? I stumbled across this interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal today. The psychiatrist who wrote the article is claiming that a growing number of people are suffering from depression and anxiety due to digital addictions. They wrote, their problem isn't trauma, social dislocation, or poverty. It's too much dopamine. What is your take on this assertion? It's difficult to imagine that these otherwise healthy young people have no trauma injuries, and it's merely the amount of screen time that's causing all of their issues. Could that be the case though? If so, it seems like we're all in trouble considering the fact that so few of us can escape the trappings of screens, whether it be for work or fun on a daily basis. End of email. Yeah. Um, so first off, uh, you know, addiction is, a, is real. This is a hard thing to tease out though, because when we study this sort of thing, we are looking retroactively at humans and trying to pinpoint variables that cause things. So, you know, normally when we do research, like if we're trying to, uh, you know, discover the distance between the moon and the sun, we run a number of experiments and we gather data and, it, you know, it's fairly discreet and numerical in terms of how far the moon average wise is from the, the earth. What did I say? Earth, yeah, sun, anyway. The distance of two bodies in space are, you know, you, you gather data and it's numerical and there's a, there's a way of verifying your data. When it comes to um, one, are people more depressed currently? How many people are depressed right now? How many people are um, suffering from anxiety? Two, how many people were suffering from depression and anxiety in the past? And three, if there's a change, what's causing that change? This is, there's so many variables and so much, uh, you know, so many caveats, because how do we know how many people are depressed right now? At what threshold? We have to um, ask people what they think. We have to have people self-report. We have to one. We have to uh, wonder were the methods different in the past? Do we have a different language system today? Do people think about themselves differently today? You know, were the same depressed people 40 years ago, would they have worded it differently or would they have responded on a survey differently? Would they have been less aware of their depression 40 years ago? You know, it, so there's so many problems in this kind of assertion, like people are more depressed now, people are more anxious and it's because of screens. Like what, you know, <laughs> anyone who understands anything about research in this area understands that like, uh, you could make some tentative um, suggestions about things, but we, you know, unlike the average distance between the Earth and the Moon, we just do. We just don't know. There's just no way to know. So that's one thing. Having said that, addiction and compulsion, you know, compulsive disorders are real and can absolutely re result in depression. And um, screen addiction, phone addiction. Uh, social media addiction is a thing. It's rare though. I find that a lot of um, discourse is around, you know, kids today, they're all addicted to their phones. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it was similar when I was a kid of everyone's, you know, all children today are addicted to TV. It's like, no, it's just fun to watch TV. You know, people aren't addicted to, to television. There's there, but having said that, there are people addicted to their phones for sure, meaning that they're they cannot put it down when there are consequences, you know, and their use interferes with their relationships, interferes with their work, interferes with their personal hygiene, or you know, you know, whatever. It it interferes in the same way that if you're using crack or you're gambling or you know these things, if you you know if you just used crack once every couple months or if you just gambled a little bit here and there and it didn't uh, it was just mildly impactful on your ch on your checking account then you know it's not an addiction right it's just something you do but if it starts to destroy your life then and you are trying to cut back and you can't 
and it's a strong compulsion, then that's when we start using the word addiction. But, you know, it's pretty rare. And there's a spectrum. Some people are mildly addicted to their phones and some people are uh, more addicted. Um, but yeah, absolutely, um, that, that can happen. And it can cause depression because it's depressing to be addicted to something. There's a lot of shame. There's a lot of powerlessness. Um, and your life starts to go down, to tu- down the tube. So, you know, naturally you get depressed about that. The other thing I'll say is that there's a fair amount of discussion about dope being uh, lately uh, where people, because there's this idea and it's not without some merit that we have too much stimulation on our pleasure centers currently, uh, you know, in the Western privileged world compared to the past because we have Netflix and we have Twitter and we have Instagram and we have, you know, Tinder and porn and, um, I don't know, just video games, you know, things that, uh, and, and perfectly designed food and Yelp reviews. And, you know, we just, we have this onslaught of marketers who are trying to make money by giving us pleasure. And they're so good at it. You know, uh, you know, hot flavored Cheetos, you know, the, there's just so many things that marketers are just dialing in to hack our brain to give us pleasure, to make us buy more of it. And it is suspect, right? And some people are uh, under the belief system that this onslaught on our dopamine, on our pleasure centers actually will burn us out to some extent. Well, it's sort of like if you go without um, salt for a while, the next time a little bit of salt will really, you'll notice it uh, usually because your, your taste buds become sort of desensitize the salt if you have a lot of it. And it can be true about, you know, pleasure as well. If you just have a, you know, a, you know, pleasure onslaughts all day long, it, it becomes kind of, you become kind of blind to the pleasure that you're experiencing. And, and it can be kind of depressing because you're always chasing this high, if, if you sense, in a sense. I, I don't think everyone is like that. And I don't think everyone is susceptible to that. You know, it is something to think about, though, in terms of how, what your life looks like and how much stimulation you have. Is it actually good for you? I don't know. I think there's some fairly reductive, uh, non-scientific notions that, you know, people will go on dopamine fasts where they uh, refrain from all cell phones or sex or whatever it is that is triggering their pleasure centers. And when they come back from the fast, they are able to consume pleasure things in a more, um, I don't know, healthy way or something. It, it is something to think about. Uh, but I, I feel like s- some of the discourse is a little silly. And I, and I think that maybe the psychiatrist is basing their argument on that, you know, that uh, dopamine related to screens is causing depression. And, and it's possible for some people, but, I, I, the, the, but, the, but the statement that you pulled out, annual patron Michael from New York City, um, is just, there's so many problems with it as you detected. Let me reread it. You know, ch- you know, kids today, their problem isn't trauma, social dislocation, or poverty. It's too much dopamine. The political problem <laughs> with this statement, it's like, I don't know what kind of, uh, social location this psychiatrist, uh, is in or possesses, but I have a feeling the psychiatrist comes from a privileged place and for them to say, uh, you know, kids today, they say they're traumatized. I don't know if this is the psychiatrist thing, but you know, kids today, they say they're traumatized. They're not traumatized. They're just on their phones too much. Kids today, they say they're, you know, there's social justice problems and that's why they're depressed. No, you know, uh, or, um, you know, kids today t- complain about the fact that they're being mistreated because of the color of their skin. No, it's because they're on their phones too much. Kids today complain that their depression comes from poverty. No, it's because they have, they're on their phones too much. I mean, if I don't know if I'm just reading into it, but it really stinks of that kind of ageism or privilegeism or something. I mean, the, <laughs> the in one sentence, just to... Uh, uh, reduce all depression and all anxiety to too much dopamine related to, you know, screens. 
and to completely discount trauma and racism and sexism and transphobia and poverty to just dismiss it like that. <laughs> it's just find uh, laughable and um, disgusting, really. I, I didn't read the whole article, but um, if, if that sentence or if that passage has anything to do with the rest of it, it's just, it's really silly. Um, the fact is there's many paths to depression and, and, and you could have one of them or all of them, right? You could have trauma. You could be treated crappy because of your gender. You could be experiencing economic hardship and you could be addicted to your phone and maybe you're addicted to your phone because of, of all the crap you're going through. I don't know, you know, or independent, you know, there's, there's a lot of roads, uh, possibly all of them leading to depression and anxiety. Um, as I said before, it's hard to know if people are more depressed or anxious today than they were before. Um, we have research studies that, you know, will show trends, but you know, like I said earlier, we're, we're relying on self-report. We don't know if in the past we had a different way of seeing these sorts of things. So it, it's hard to know. Um, clearly we have a problem. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of anxious and depressed people today. And I think there were a lot in the past as well. Uh, and we need to have a better approach to it. And we need to have uh, more public health and more awareness about it. And to just discount trauma and racism, sexism, um, ageism, you know, uh, ableism, a all the classism and poverty to just discount that as something we don't need to focus on. Uh, <laughs> I find it be extremely suspect. All right, let's take a break. All right, we're back from the break. Anonymous patron wrote in and she said, in spending more time with my family recently, my mom does this thing where she'll get really close to people physically when she's telling them something. She will really emphasize her points on whatever she's saying. Her eyes will be big. She will repeat herself if they don't respond how she wants. She'll even point out if they're not showing enough interest in what she's saying. I've never quite seen behavior like this anywhere else, but it's always made me feel suffocated and I tend to have a short temper around her. I know you can't diagnose from afar, but is this something often seen in histrionic people? Sometimes I feel like her personality overtook mine so much that I never even had the chance to form one. I've always been underexpressive and felt insecure about it that I can't quite convey what people seem to want. End of email. Yeah, absolutely. So, I don't, I, I, yeah, I, as you say, I can't diagnose from afar, but... For histrionic people, it, it's not uncommon for them to have a presentation like that. And you describe it really well, you know, because often histrionic personality disorder is described as like attention seeking. But what does that mean exactly? Because certainly there are some people that you know, like me right now, I'm seeking attention. I am you know, recording my voice and I'm on the Internet. Does that mean I'm histrionic? Uh, you know, it, it's all in the details and in, in the emotional um uh, feeling the vibe. That's why when I diagnose people with personality disorders, it's often uh, a big portion of the data that I use to diagnose someone is how I feel when I'm around them. And you're describing very well what it feels like to be, you know, it's one thing for someone to be very expressive emotionally or to, you know, be extroverted or they like to be on stage, this sort of thing. It's another person. It's it's another it's another situation. If someone is constantly, you know, or very frequently trying to get in your face and and garner your full attention, and if you don't give them like a histrion a histrionic response to their histrionics, then they get even more histrionic. If that makes any sense. And the trauma for histrionic folks is that they were not paid attention to enough. They were not attuned to enough. And they learned early in life, like at the age of 18 months to five years, that in order for them to feel safe, they have to be getting attention. And we can imagine that a two-year-old might feel that way, right? Like two-year-olds don't go off into their office for eight hours by themselves. Two-year-olds need, and, and younger, 18-month-old children need almost constant attention from their parents, but we expect that that's okay. Well, if you don't give that to them, then people become stuck in that phase where they're in this 
you know, constant treadmill of hypervigilance around like, you're paying attention to me, right? Like you, you're paying full attention to me and you, you don't, you're not paying attention to anything else. And not every infant is like this, but you'll see this sometimes like your infant will react when you look at your phone or when you pay attention to another kid or when you're just distracted or something, your kid will just be like, Hey, look at me. And again, for an 18 month old, we will say, well, that's just, that's kids. But, uh, for an adult to do that, it, it, it seems strange. And, and it'll, the key is, is how it makes you feel right. Like it's one thing if someone's like, Hey, pay attention to me, but they're flexible. If you don't want to pay attention to them for your mom, it sounds like she has a history of doing that to the point where you, it sounds like we're not attuned to enough by her, given her uh, traumas and her hypervigilance around attention, such that you didn't get the attunement or the attention you, you, you needed, and as a result, have not developed a connection with who you are. So obviously, therapy is the answer to that. This next email is from listener Scarlett. She says, is it normal to want your ex to mourn your relationship before they date other people? I just had a breakup with my girlfriend of about a year this past month. I had to break it off because she slept with a man. We had no prior discussion if I felt it was okay for her to do that. We consider ourselves both poly, but I need to have communication about those things before they happen, not after. It's not. It's only been a week and she is still sleeping with the guy still, not to mention that she still has multiple dates scheduled with people already. I am honestly so crushed that she could move on so quickly. I genuinely feel like I am the only one processing this breakup while she is distracting herself with new people. I wonder if this is jealousy I'm feeling. I just wish she would mourn our relationship a bit longer before deciding to see other people. What are your thoughts? End of email. Yeah, it's totally normal. It's this almost universal thing that when we break up, it's uh, there's a lot of question marks, right? And one of the questions is, was my relationship real? Did, did this person ever love me? Did they care about me? There's, a, there's some evidence during a breakup that they don't really care about you and that really hurts. And so we're wondering, do, did, do they care? Do I matter? And one of the ways that we gauge that is how much uh, seemingly uh, reactive the person is to breaking up with us. And if it looks like they just didn't care, then it, it the, the, I don't know, Sometimes what people will conclude is this person doesn't care about me. They never cared about me. I'm not worthy of being taken care of that kind of thing. And it's normal. The The other thing is, you know, to, to think about is everyone processes grief in a different way. Right. Um, and for some people, they put it off for some people. They grieve by dating other people. They will grieve by distraction and that's okay. It doesn't mean that they don't have feelings. Doesn't mean they don't care. It just means that that's just how they're doing it. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is to focus on your own grief and not other people's grief. It's normal to, you know, want your partner to, you know, have this huge uh, grieving process very outward, but you know, that's, that's not really helpful. You should be thinking about yourself and you, you shouldn't be, spending a lot of time evaluating how she is um, dealing with, you know, seemingly you're plus you're making a lot of assumptions. She could be crying herself to sleep every night. She could be talking about you with all of her other partners, you know, with all of her, you know, dates, she could be like, Oh, I, you know, I just had this breakup. It's really sad. Like you just don't know. And if you wanted to know, then maybe talk with her and just tell her, I, I wouldn't criticize her and say, I can't believe you're dating other. I just be like, Hey, I'm really sad about breaking up. I just wanted to, you know, ask you if, if you cared, you know, because it, I really want, you know, we're done, we're, our relationship's over, but I just want to feel like you, that you liked me and you loved me and, and that you're sorry that you cheated on me. Uh, I'm not asking you to grovel or to hate yourself, but I, I guess I just feel like I want our relationship to be better. You know, that's, that's absolutely normal and it would be moral and good for her own emotional life as well to have those sensitive conversations. Um, so that's what I'll say about that, but I'm sorry, you know, you went through it and your, you know, your partner cheated on you. You're, you're poly, but that doesn't mean people can just cheat on you. It means you're supposed to talk about things as you said before they do it. And then you broke up and you know, after a year, that's, um, 
you know, it's, it's a lot of pain, a lot of sadness, and that's going to last a long time. All right, this next question from patron Alyssa from Tokyo. She writes, any mental health advice for university students in a cross-cultural environment? I am part of a mental health initiative at my university in Tokyo, but it's difficult to manage the different cultural ideas of mental health among the students since we all come from different places. My question is, how do you promote mental health as a worthy value when cultural conceptions around it differ so much from place to place? Also, I just wanted to ask that I am also half Japanese and half white, and I am so happy to have a HAPA representation through someone like you. Ah, well, thank you for that, Alyssa. And um, uh, it's nice to get an email from a HAPA sister such as yourself. So you say that you're part of a mental health initiative, a university, difficult to manage, different cultural ideas. How do you promote mental health as a worthy value when everyone concept, you know, conceives of mental health as a uh, Differently from place to place, excuse me. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> uh, you know, the idea of mental health is so different from place to place. And it's normal. So there's a there's tension between two things. One is, is you know, understanding that the way you see things is not universal. The other thing to think about is just because another culture has its own values doesn't mean that those values are helpful to those individuals in that culture. For example, you could have a culture that like mine in the United States that uh, we there's a, a, a sort of streak in our culture of people saying you can't you know you're not supposed to spoil infants in toddlers because that will make them into you know crybabies or mama's children or something and weak and you need to make kids strong well that's a cultural value that we have that is completely wrong and destructive to the goals of parenting and and the goals of life so just because something is cultural doesn't mean that it's good just because something is different doesn't mean that you're supposed to quote unquote respect it um but how do you know the difference between the things that are harmful to another culture as you're looking at it or just different and not necessarily harmful because it can look harmful from afar, but in reality, it's just different from your culture. So, you know, there's a lot of tension there and there's no way to definitively answer those questions. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, the general guideline though, is to have a lot of discussions to bring in those voices from people. If when you're making decisions, have other voices that come in and say like, well, here's how we see mental health and just have those conversations. You know, it, it it's hard, but it's really the only way you can't just, um, there's no way to emerge wisdom without those conversations. And it's not even guaranteed when you do have those conversations, but it's, it's really the only way there. So that's what I would do. All right. This next email is from anonymous patron. She writes, what do you think about the term, privilege being used when discussing body image and mental health issues around it. Lately, I've seen several posts by therapists on Instagram lately using terms like thin privilege or pretty privilege while discussing body image issues, body dysmorphic disorder, and eating disorders. These posts state that if society sees you as conventionally attractive and or thin, regardless of if you personally suffer from an eating disorder, then you still have these privileges due to how others see you. I understand what they are saying, but I worry about using the term pri privilege when it comes to mental health could do more harm than good. What are your thoughts on this? End of email. Well, I'd have to see these posts and talk to these folks. You know, Instagram and Twitter don't really lend itself to nuance and discussion. So uh, sometimes it's hard to know what people mean. I think usually people are coming from a good place and uh, an educated, uh, flexible place, but you know, Instagram, Twitter doesn't really lend itself to that. So it's hard to know, but, um, are thin people privileged? Yeah. Are pretty people privileged? Yes. Research shows this, you know, we, we have data that demonstrates that thin, pretty people, uh, uh particularly men are considered, you know, thin, tall, handsome, white, men are considered smart, smarter than they are. They're considered more competent than they are. They're more hireable. They get higher pay, you know, all these kinds of things. They're voted for more, you know, in, in politics. So 
thin and pretty privilege are are a thing for sure. So let's you know we can say that we can and you're agreeing with that. But if we're using it in discussions regarding eating disorders and body dysmorphia, um, you know I don't know. Again, I'm not there in that conversation. You know may, maybe it's a part of it. You know there's intersectionality in in all these areas and in every area, including. Um, body dysmorphia, you know, you could experience body dysmorphia while also having thin privilege or while not having thin privilege, you know, and that's how all these things work. You know, there's various different identities that um, often people will add to the discussion, which is, which is good. You know, uh, it's not like you have, it's not like everyone with body dysmorphia experiences the same levels of oppression from the outside. You know, that's, it's just not true. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that when you have an oppressed group of people, there can be a tendency for infighting to develop as a result of the stress that is put on them from the outside. And sometimes, and I don't know if this is what's happening, but it, it kind of sounds like that maybe, that you have people who are being oppressed in, from various angles and um, there's a lot of pain in that, and there can be anger. And sometimes that anger can be directed toward other people in, in your group, you know, other comrades that are also being oppressed. Um, like for me, as an Asian American, I've experienced that, that you'll have Asian Americans will attack, you know, like um, I'm Japanese American, and, and which means that uh, you know, Japanese Americans generally came over a hundred years ago ish. And so pretty Americanized, no accent. And, uh, Japanese people would look down at Vietnamese people or Cambodians be or Filipinos because they're, you know, fresh off the boat to the point where I would hear Asian people calling other Asian people boaters, you know, meaning they're fresh off the boat as a huge, huge class is put down, you know, Oh, look at those boaters over there. You know, if you would hear an accent or if they're speaking heaven forbid in their native language at the mall or something, Oh, look at those. And so these are Asians being racist against Asians being classist against Asians. And why is that? Well, because Asians are oppressed and when you're oppressed, you're hurt and you get angry and, as a way of trying to get at some of the power in society, you'll absorb the ideas of the oppressor. And, um, you know, those things happen. So I, I don't know if that's what's happening here of just people within the body dysmorphia community trying to, you know, just survive and attacking each other occasionally through these uh, labels of like, okay, you know, you can't say anything because you have thin privilege you know you're you're less of a community member because you have because you have some privilege you know i i don't know if that's what's happening um at the same time there is a thing there is privilege and if you are possessing that privilege and you're stomping all over the place with your privilege then you know sometimes that should be pointed out i just don't know what sort of post you're talking about all right this next email is from patron robin from michigan she says why do you think there is stigma around having more than one or two pets? I have five cats and the snide remarks from others throw out there are tiring to me. The snide remarks that others throw out there are tiring to me. Maybe if I understood them more, it wouldn't sting so much. So I'm wondering if you can offer any insight into why people do this. End of email. It's just a cultural thing. You know, we have arbitrary cultural ideas and I'm sure it has history somewhere, but I can't really, uh, you know, figure out, I, I don't have a good hypothesis as to why it's particularly cats, right? Cause if you have five dogs, you're like, Oh fun. You have five cats. It's like, Oh, what's wrong with you? I'm guessing it's associated with women, you know, I, because we will genderize um, animals like, you know, dogs are for men because they're strong and cats are for women because they're weak and weird. You know, it's like all this total ridiculousness. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, that's where it came from. There might've been a tendency for older widows to have cats as for, as companions. And there was some sexism and ageism around that. I don't know, but yeah, it is tiring. It is freaking stupid. If you have five cats, God bless you. Right. 
if you have 15 cats, you know, and you manage it well, then God bless you. You know, great. Good for you. What's the freaking problem, people? And this whole idea, yeah, don't even get me started. I, um, you know, have had many cats. I've had many dogs. Uh, what's the big deal? You know, again, especially cats. Yeah, don't even get me started, Patreon. So you're saying, you know, if you understood them, maybe it wouldn't sting so much. Well, let me help you. They're idiots. So don't regard anything they say. Anyone who has stigma around people having cats, they're freaking stupid. They haven't thought about life <laughs> sufficiently such that they can evaluate things. So, you know, on these reality TV shows, sometimes I'll watch, you know, they'll stigmatize these guys who have like two cats. I'm, it's like, you can tell that the show is trying to go like, oh, look at this weirdo guy who has two cats. I'm just like, what's wrong with you people? Like, are you that stupid that that's supposed to be a bad thing? What possible bad could result from having two cats? You know, answer that question, society. What possible bad could there be for a woman to live alone and have five cats? What problem, what harm to you or society or to anyone or to themselves could a, you know, a single woman who lives alone with five cats, what harm to society is there? There's no answer to that question. And if there is, it's dubious. And if it is, you're reaching because there's no problem in the same way that having one cat, in the same way that having no cats, in the same way that having five dogs, there's no problem. If you're taking care of the animals and they're clean and, and everything's fine and you can have guests over and everything's fine, because of course you can, then what is the problem? And yeah, it, you know, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I got to go. I have to teach class in one minute. So everyone out there, please take care of yourself and have as many freaking cats as you want because you deserve it. You really, really do.